Man, that was good stuff this morning. Thank you all for leading us before the throne of God and in worship this morning. I don't know if you about you guys, but I can testify to the goodness of God. My word. Mm. That was part of the lesson that we've got today in, in uh, adult Sunday school was, uh, was just that, that uh, we don't have to have things perfect for Him to use us. We don't have to have it all together because that'll never happen. <laughs> At least not on this side of, of eternity anyway. And then, yet... He is still faithful to come alongside us and utilize us for His glory. That, uh, that to me is just uh, something I don't think I'll ever completely understand. I'm going to add that to my list of those questions. And I'm trying to figure out how to get that slipped through to eternity, uh, that list, uh, because uh, you know I just don't know how we're going to make it uh, there. If they won't allow a U-Haul in, he surely ain't going to allow my list. Uh, <laughs> of questions to ask him uh, and the saints. We are going to continue. Uh, yes, sir, in, in Acts, we have made it all the way to chapter 11, guys. We are, we are zooming. We are zooming. Uh, we saw last week that culmination of the past three weeks, or the past three Sundays, of God working in Peter, God working in Cornelius, and ultimately both of those lives, along with others that witnessed that, uh, a metamorphosis taking place. From in Cornelius's case, a good man worshiping God in the best way he knew how outside of the Hebrew race as a Gentile, and then coming within the fold of the church. Of Christ. Then we saw the Holy Spirit working in Peter himself in drawing him to an understanding of what it means by the Abrahamic covenant with, that God made with Abram at the time, later Abraham, that all nations will be blessed by this covenant that he made. And so now we have a level playing field of sorts. This, what was initially preached and disclosed to the Jewish people of Jerusalem, this salvation through Christ Jesus, Him being the Messiah, the Son of God, and the only atonement for our sins is now being spread outside to not only to Samaria the Jews within Samaria but now the Gentiles in these areas as we have this multiplication taking place of believers in this new way and here we have in 11 we are going to see sort of a phasing I hate to say this like but almost like a exit stage left for Peter is after 12, you don't see him really much on the scene as far as the book of Acts goes. But we know that his ministry continues uh, elsewhere because of other writings within the New Testament, within his two uh, epistles, uh, both First and Second Peter. We know that he continues in his work for the Lord. But what happens after verse 12 is we have a transition and uh, that we've seen... Lord knows how many throughout our study in the book of Acts already, but we see that transition take place where as far as the Gentile church and its ministry and the growth of it is being done more by Paul than it is Peter. And we'll get into that in more detail as we go ahead. Let's, uh, let's open in a word of prayer before we go into God's word. Father God, Lord, I pray that your spirit would fall upon us today. That 
that all the worries and anxieties and pressures and turmoil that is going on in our lives, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, our states, our nation, and this world would be put at ease and comforted by you. Lord, let all things that would distract us today be cast aside and our attention lie solely on you and your word. Lord, give us ears to hear. Open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth today. And may what we learn from it be proclaimed in the days ahead. And may it all glorify you. In the name of Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen. So here we are. We're going to go through 18 verses. And I know you're saying, there's Coy, there's no way. You can't do it. You can't do it. And you may be right. I don't know. We're going to let the Holy Spirit decide that. However, that is, that is, the, that is what I, attempt, I am going to attempt to do today through the power of the Spirit. And uh, unlike yesterday's smackdown in the park out there by Miss Brandy, uh, I believe I am empowered by the Holy Spirit. So maybe I can do this. That was in the flesh yesterday and I fell quite short. But what we're going to do is we're going to roll through these. I'm going to read through them, and then we'll go back and we'll break these down verse by verse, which is sort of our norm here. So starting in chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went out, you went in, rather, to the uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. An object descending like a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed, I intently and I, when I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I also heard a voice saying to me, "Rise, Peter, kill and eat." But I said, "Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has any time entered my mouth." But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you the words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift he has given us when we, began, when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance unto life. We see right here that there is far more going on than just Peter, than just the apostles, than just Cornelius. We are seeing God's working in all the details. And I'm reminded, I, I meant to bring a, a piece of rope today. You know, there's more to making a knot than just some twists and turns. You can take that piece of rope and by a couple of twists, a couple of turns, a, a loop in, a loop out, and everything else, you have created a way to bind 
objects together. You've harnessed objects and were able to fasten them aside one by one in a bundle. Or it could be used as an instrument once that knot is created to pull something along. But yet that rope is made up of multiple, multiple, multiple strands individually. Now, I don't know about you guys, I'm terrified of heights, so this analogy does not fit me, but just try to follow along with me. I am not going to climb the side of a mountain, let me inter interject this, period. <laughs> However, if I was to attempt this feat, I surely wouldn't do it with a thimble of thread. There's just not enough there to hold this boy up. However, you take multiple strands of those threads, you weave them together, and then from those you weave them together, and the next thing you know, you have a rope that has strength. I'm amazed when I think back to the t biblical times they didn't have the looms that we have today. They didn't have the, the mechanical ability to, to sew and, and weave and things like we do today, especially mass production anyway. That's why when we saw about Tabitha uh, earlier as we've been reading through uh, the book of Acts, that's why people cherished what she made for them because they knew it was time consuming. She took those individual threads put them together in such a way that it made a cloak, it made a, a shawl, it made a head covering, whatever the case may be. They knew that it took time and energy and investment and love in order to design that. And we forget as we read through God's Word that it takes time and effort and attention and love on God's part to weave all these facets together into something that is unbreakable. 2,000 years later, here we are today as part of the body of Christ, part of the church and the bride of Christ. 2,000 years later, because of the time and energy and investment and love that God has placed into calling His creation unto Him. And sadly enough, as we go through this, we'll understand that this is foreign to Peter. And it is foreign to the apostles. It is foreign to the, the church which was initiated in Jerusalem. Yet this is a tipping point right here that we see where they realize Wow, we're not in this alone. Wow, we've got to address this in an entirely different way. Wow, everything we thought to this point is a lie or was misconstrued. Wow, now we understand Genesis 12. So, in unraveling that, let's start in verse 1. Now, the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And in that implication there, we could see they received the word of God. It doesn't say they received salvation through the hand of God, through His Son, Jesus Christ. They've just been presented with the gospel message. So by, by Luke's account right here, they're like, okay, somebody went a little outside the lines, and I can understand that. My, me coloring is, is not the tidiest looking thing in the world. However, this is a shock to them. 
they think this is, at this point in time is possibly a waste of time. Because we need to understand that when the Messiah came, therefore, Jerusalem would be built up and elevated. Judea would be reunited under the kingship and authority of the Messiah. That he would rule. Rome would no longer have a stranglehold upon that entire area. As a matter of fact, if we go back a few pages to Acts 1, and we look at verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Him, saying, Lord, will You at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They knew Him as the Messiah. They recognized Him as the Messiah. And they understood that now Israel would be restored into their rightful place, their rule as the chosen people of God. So whenever they hear word that, okay, we're presenting, we're presenting our, the gospel message of our Messiah, you can sort of see that attitude uh, towards that this is our Savior. It doesn't belong to these other people. You can understand their confusion. You can understand how they may be a little bit concerned about this whole situation. And I know they probably got to be thinking, even though this is from Jesus' mouth, about casting pearls before the swine. You're taking something that is valuable, the most valuable thing that ever could be presented to you in this lifetime, and you're just throwing it before these dogs, these Gentile dogs. So now that we understand what, they, what their thinking is, and this is, this is Christians now. This isn't the Sanhedrin. This isn't Sadducees. This isn't Pharisees. This is the Christian church and Christians within the church. And it says in verse 2, And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him. So this word, this feedback, got back to Jerusalem long before Peter did. Because I'm pretty sure Peter didn't see this take place and made a V-line back to Jerusalem. Because he's still processing it too. He's like, okay, I cannot deny what I just saw God do amongst these Gentile believers. The evidence of it was exactly a duplication of what we saw take place on the day of Pentecost. However, he stayed with them as verse 48 uh, in, in chapter 10 says, he stayed with them a few more days. There was some understanding, there was some additional knowledge that needed to be conveyed to these new believers. And then I can imagine that Peter didn't stop evangelizing on his way back. He is doing what God called him to do. So it, it took a little time for him to be there in Jerusalem, whereas the word of what took place got there instantaneously. Because, you know, of course they were on TikTok and Facebook and all that kind of stuff. It got, the, it got there instantly. But notice the description that Luke uses here in chapter 2. Those of the circumcision. Isn't that peculiar that he takes this group of people and draws a circle around them? These are the Jewish people who were Jews, people that served Yahweh, but were stuck in the principles of the law. Yes, they recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Yes, they surrendered themselves to His Lordship. Yes, they knew that He is the Son of the one true God, Yahweh. 
But how do you discard 30, 40, 50, let's just say, let's go make it earlier, say 20 years within Judaism, and all you do is learn the laws, what, what bounds you need to stay within, what parameters uh, you, know, you need to not overstep. And you can't just crumble those up and throw those away just because you receive Christ as your Savior. Now let's take that in our context today. If we don't have to do a show of hands or anything like that, but I assure you that each one of us here that have received Christ as our Savior are carrying baggage from our days prior to Christ. I, I, I know mine is probably not just a bag, a single bag. Mine is probably 18-wheeler, two 18-wheelers worth. And it takes oh, what seems like an eternity, I'm going to use that sort of tongue-in-cheek, in order for us to discard everything, all the bias, all the, the nonsense that we bring to the table as Christians, it takes forever to get those out of our lives. Matter of fact, I would pretty much say that in the midst of us developing ourselves as Christians, as growing in Christ, we are doing two things. We are presenting the gospel message to those who do not, do not know Him as best we can, given the amount of ammunition that we give ourselves through God's Word and the power of His Holy Spirit. And then at the same time, we are trying to daily discard those nuances that we bring along with us. And that's just individually. Look what we're trying to do as a body of believers in a church or a denomination. I mean, there, we have added so much nonsense and tradition into what it is to believe upon the Lord Christ as your Savior that we have done nothing more than done the same thing that the Jews did with what God gave them. And what ends up happening is we render ourselves useless as a whole because we have bound ourselves by tradition, by speculation, by all the things that we war with one another. Think of, think of the denominational splits and rifts and stuff that I don't know outside of Christ Jesus, I don't know if they'll ever be repaired. Because it's things of man. And if there's anything that can botch anything up, my dad would say, you know, son, you could tear up an anvil with a rubber mallet. Man can mess some things up. And we see that taking place. And we can see God's intervention and not allowing that to happen right here in these 18 verses. Now this was the contention between those left in Judea and Peter in verse 3, saying, You went into the uncircumcised men and ate with them. Those are two things. You went in, you associated with them, and then you ate with them. One, the hoity-toity Jews of that day, they would gather up their garments as close to them as they possibly could as they walked throughout their neighborhoods, throughout the markets, to prevent themselves from brushing up against a Gentile. And then if, God forbid, that did happen... Those garments that we said took so much time and so much energy and everything to create, they would either have to go through an entire process. It didn't like you go to your washing machine and throw that thing in there and put it on the uh, anti-Gentile cycle. It wasn't that easy. It had, I mean, there was, there was ceremonies 
over cleaning your clothes, setting them aside to make them to where they're reusable. And also yourself. But guess what? That had nothing to do with what God gave to Moses. There is nothing in there in the Mosaic Law that says you, get, you better buy a washing machine with an anti-Mosaic cycle. I mean, anti-Gentile cycle on it. Nothing. Man in, uh, interjected that. And then the other thing is you ate with them. Unfortunately, these poor, these poor Hebrews, then and today, have never been blessed with a rack of ribs. God forbid they come down to Louisiana and try to go to a crawfish bowl. They're missing out. Bless their heart. Verse 4 says, But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, and notice that he explained it in order from the beginning. Now that right there is of God in and of itself. God is a God of order. He is a God of details. He is a God that, hey, we are not going to overlook any aspect of this as we are conveying this message. And I want you to notice something. Peter isn't the only knothead that has to have things told to him three times. Just like, let's say, this instance here when he had that vision. That vision of those animals that we're going to discuss again... That came down three times. And Peter said, Not so, Lord. You won't find me eating any of that because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a super, super believer. Super Jew. Guess what? This is the third time that God has explained this to us. We had this story twice in chapter 10, we've got it revealed to us one more time today. So what does that say about us? What does that say about this message? Thankfully, somebody picked it up along the way and kept hold of it. Because otherwise, we wouldn't be beneficiaries of God's saving grace today as Gentiles. So here Peter breaks it down for him one more time. I was in the city of Joppa, Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. You notice he did leave out, I was in a tanner's house. We'll just look over that. When I observed it, and this was intently and considered, how many times throughout the day does God reveal himself to us, myself, you know, us in general, and we just overlook it? We just say, you know, hey, this isn't worth paying attention to. Just this morning in prayer and praise request, we had two things that came about. We have... Bless, and I mean this in a, in a different way of, in sarcasm, but bless the heart of Daisy. At what, five months old? No, she's born in March. Oh my goodness, guys. This young, this young infant going through heart surgery. We have two like that that we are praying for within this congregation that are infants haven't even crawled, have not even taken their first step that are going through major surgeries. And what was supposed to be multiple hours of a surgery only took shortly over one. Guys, that is the hand of God. That is a miracle that you cannot look past. Them doctors, hey, Praise God for them. But I'm going to tell you what. The great physician, it was the one orchestrating the entire deal. 
Then we've got a report of, from Miss Jan. From someone who died, who passed away in front of a witness to be restored to life. That is improving day by day from that time. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the hand of God because He is the one who orchestrates life and death. And He said, yeah, you're having some trouble physically, but my spirit is within you. He will restore you. And it happened. We can't look past that and say, oh, that's just happenstance. Oh, it happens from time to time. I don't know if y'all know this or not, but God happens every minute, every second of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, of every decade, of every century, of every millennium. God never fails. He never stops. For those of us who acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior, and even for those that do not know Him, He never stops. He never fails. And He's not right here. Peter could cower down. He's with his guys. He could say, man, I know that took place over there. Y'all have heard word of this, but let's just get back in our little circle and keep on keeping on. Peter could have done that vast majority of us in churches probably would have done that. Which is, well, it's comfortable in this little niche. I'm going to get back into that fold and just forget what happened. But not Peter. Peter stands before all of them. One of eleven. Outnumbered. And he says, you're dang right. I was in the city of Joppa praying like a good little Jewish boy should do. And he told them about what took place. Praying. And when God made himself visible, when he manifested himself in those images on that sheet, he was observant. And he was observant with intent. He was focused. There is a difference between those that will acknowledge the working and the hand of God in our day-to-day -day activities and those who would just bypass it. Those that would just flippantly play it off as something that happens on an everyday basis. So he saw all these, these animals both the earth and the air and creepy things and those under the sea that we would cook in a roux and keep on keeping on. And he said, And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And I love this response because he didn't hold anything back. Peter, in verse 8, Peter said, Then I said, Not so, Lord. Is that not, is that not an oxymoron? Yes, you're a God of all creation. You give me the breath to, live, to actually continue to live on this earth that you created. And I'm, yes, Lord, no, sir, Lord. I won't do it. Wow. We do that all the time. I do it all the time. I've never eaten of any of these things. Every time I go to a ball game, Lord, I'm eating a, a Nathan's hot dog that is fully kosher. I would never eat a bar S weenie. I hope David hears that at some point in time. <laughs> but the voice answered me again from heaven, what God has cleansed you must not call common. And Peter does it again. 
Because he knows the relevance of numbers. He, he understands the relevance of things being repeated. And in verse 10 he says, Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. Peter did two things at that point in time. He said, look, it took me three times to barely get a grasp of what God was telling me. I'm not the sharpest pencil in the pack. I've got a lot of things that are distracting me in life. And God has to pull me up by the shirt collar more than once to get my attention and set me straight. I think we could testify to that. I know I can. But he also said, listen guys, this wasn't a one time happening. God did not say verily, verily and get my attention with two repetitions. He drove it home with a third. In verse 11, he continues with his description of the, the incident. He said, At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go. Even in the midst of his confusion and trying to figure out what it is that he witnessed, his relationship with Christ was so tight that even in the midst of his confusion, he was able to hear from the Spirit. That's something that I, I, I hope we're all striving for. That our relationship, our dialogue, our reading God's Word, our, all these things are drawing us so close to God that even in the midst of this chaos that is outside these walls, that we would still hear and feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit told me to go with them. Doubt nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me and we entered the man's house. Now this is, this is also the second part of Peter's justification, his argument, his pronouncement of what has taken place. First, he said, hey, I heard from the Lord. I saw a vision from the Lord. Second, here, I, brought, I have six witnesses of what took place here. I'm going to throw this in there as interjection. If we go back, we realize that there was three that came from the uh, Cornelius' house from Caesarea. There's six that came from Joppa along with Peter. That makes ten. That is the number of witness throughout God's Word. Don't overlook little things like that. They hold importance. So he says, hey, there's witnesses on both sides that can back me up in this. And then he says, and he told us, and this is, uh, and he being uh, Cornelius, he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you the words by which you and all your household will be saved. So he is making a proclamation from the other side. He's bringing in a witness in his defense of his actions here saying, this man saw from God as well and he's not Jewish. And all the details that led up to this point, and so I have Cornelius to be able to lean on as I proclaim and defend my position. And the angel said, this man, Peter, will be able to tell you how you and your household will be saved. Man, you're starting to, starting to tighten up all his defenses. They're almost impenetrable at this point. In verse 15, he nails it home. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. The beginning of what? This would be Pentecost. He's referring back to the beginning of God's pouring out of His Holy Spirit and the 
construction, the beginning construction, the foundation being laid of the church. And this, this is the part that locks it up right here. Verse 16, Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If these people are showing the same signs and doing the exact same thing when the Holy, as, as when the Holy Spirit fell upon the Jewish people at the day of Pentecost, and now that same thing is transpiring upon the Gentiles, how in the world can we argue? And that very verse that he said right there in verse 16, if you go back to... Acts 1 verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And you can go all the way back to Joel 2.28 to see that in the Old Testament when this is going to take place. So he used... His reputation, and that's shaky at best with Peter, and probably shaky at best for all of us if we really want to be honest. But you've got to start somewhere in your defense. And then he used eyewitness accounts of what was taking place. Then he lent credence to the Holy Spirit in taking two positions and saying, hey, these are identical. The day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming down. The day in Caesarea, the Holy Spirit coming down upon Gentiles, they are identical. We've seen this take place before. And then he used the Scripture to close the deal. And you want to see what the outcome is? Verse 17 says, If therefore God gave them the same gift as he, as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to withstand God? Y'all remember what Gamaliel said, his advice to the Sanhedrin earlier on in, in the book of Acts? He said the same thing. Hey, if this, this whole Christian thing, this, this movement of the way is of God, you're not going to do anything to, to stamp it out. But if, if it's not, it'll fall apart on its own. And here we see Peter using almost the same kind of uh, verbiage here. Who am I to get in the way of what God has going on? He knew his place. This wasn't a situation where he, they were taking their thoughts and their, their ideas of what will work best and what they deem would be beneficial for all these people and then all of a sudden trying to plug God into that? That's what's going on in churches today. When you take this prosperity gospel, when you take this lovey-dovey, there's multiple ways in to heaven and eternity, and you take all that garbage and you try to plug in God's Word to prove your point... There's two things in me. God, the, through, through the Spirit, God tells me, Lord, show them the error of their ways. Redeem them before time is too late. And there's a part of me that's more fleshly that says, stoke the fires. They're coming. Just being honest. But we have generations that are out there right now that are being bombarded by that feel-good prosperity gospel and this, I don't even know what you want to call it in these multiple ways to achieve salvation.
And we wonder why people are confused. We wonder why people come in and surrender themselves to Christ under these false pretenses. And whenever prosperity doesn't fall upon them, but hard times do, whenever they feel let alone because left alone rather, because they come in just because we need numbers and then you're, you're cast out to your own devices, we wonder why the United States can sit there and poll saying that we are 70% Christians when we know dang well just by the evidence of what's going on, it is not the case. But here... But here, we see people that are still abiding by what took place before the falling of the Holy Spirit. We see people praying. We see people fellowshipping with one another. We see people in God's Word as best they have it from the Old Testament at this point in time. They are seeking and searching and conveying the mind of God. And they are relying fully upon the Holy Spirit. And I can say that with authority because in verse 18, it says, When they heard these things, they became silent. Argument done. Point made, chalk one up for the good guys. But I can say it with even more authority by what said stated next. And they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance unto life. This wasn't, oh, we, we don't have an argument, we don't have a leg to stand on here, but I'm going to go along with it, gritting their teeth the whole time. This is not the case. In what they understand, and what they're trying to get their mind around, all glory be to God. Guys, if there's not hope for us in the future days, and, and uh, today and the days ahead, we do not have it all together. We are learning bit by bit, being spoon-fed, and thank, that God, thank God we have His Word. Thank God we have His Holy Spirit. Thank God we have this opportunity of fellowship with other believers to keep us in line, to help us in the the tough times, the hard times, and the struggles. Because daily, God is lending truth. God is lending wisdom to those who seek Him. And the only thing we can do is glorify Him. Thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of my struggles, even in the midst of me trying to figure out this particular scripture or whatever in your word or a circumstance that I may be in that I don't fully understand, all those things, in all those things, glorify Him. Because just like we talked about in that rope situation earlier, He's taking the time to weave it all together to make it all come to His good. And we're beneficiaries of it all along the way. So right here, guys, God uses Peter. It's the same Peter we know and love, the Peter that is as real as real can be and we can sort of sympathize with him I know I can don't know if he ever lived a day of his life without the taste of sandal in his mouth and God uses him and will continue to use him as we continue reading to nail the points home that God's word his eternal kingdom is for more than the Jew. It's for the Gentile as well. And the body of believers said, Amen. Point taken. 
Now, how do we move forward with this? There's a lot more to this, guys, that we can't get into in the time that we have, but there is great detail when you understand that now, and we'll see this in Acts 15 as well, what does that mean for us as Jews? If Gentiles can receive Christ as their Savior, if Gentiles can use the Jewish Messiah as their Savior, what happens to us? Because we've got promises from the Old Testament that were given to us. What do we do with all that? But God, God's got all that worked out in His due time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your truth. We thank You for enlightening Your Word through Your Holy Spirit, illuminating it for our comprehension. Lord, you created us. As sharp as we may think we are, Lord, we are so simple in our ways. Prone to wonder, as the song states. Lord, help us to understand our need for you. Let our desire, whether we know you as our Lord and Savior or whether we do not, Lord, I pray that your Spirit would prompt in us a desire, a growing desire, like a building flame, to search and seek you above all things. Lord, as we present ourselves before you in prayer, I pray that those that may not know you as their Lord and Savior would take this opportunity to receive you as their, their Messiah. To seek you as their atonement for sin. To be their assurance of eternity lived in your presence. Lord, I don't want to scare anybody into anything, but this moment is the only moment that we have. The next is not promised to us. Take advantage of this moment. And for those of us that do know you as our Lord and Savior, Lord, help us to redeem the time that we are given to make the best use of the moments that you allot us. That someone would be drawn closer to Christ Jesus through our words and deeds. This is our prayer, Lord. May our Holy Spirit fall down upon us, burden us, until we have no choice but to move and act in your favor. In the precious name of Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen.